On October 8, 2018, Hurricane Michael underwent a 48-hour rapid intensification period where it went from a Category 1 hurricane to a Category 4 hurricane. By landfall on October 10, 2018 at 12.30 p.m. Central Time, Hurricane Michael was an unprecedented for the region Category 5 hurricane, making landfall near Tyndall Air Force Base, Florida. Hurricane Michael was the strongest hurricane in recorded history to make landfall on the Florida Panhandle. Landing with sustained winds of 161 miles per hour and a minimum pressure of 919 millibars, the storm was the fourth most powerful hurricane to hit the United States. Spreading devastation far inland through many counties in northwestern Florida, from Bay County, Gulf County, Calhoun County, even through Jackson County and Leon County, where the state capital is located. Hurricane Michael was unique in that it maintained its major hurricane status all the way through the Florida-Georgia state line. As it entered Seminole County, Georgia, it was still a strong Category 3 hurricane. Across northwestern Florida and into the state of Georgia, Hurricane Michael was responsible for $25 billion in damages. These are the 31 voices of Hurricane Michael representing the many unique experiences and perspectives of the community members who endured the storm and its impacts. Voices of hope, empathy, pain, lessons learned, grit, determination, and extensive insight into one of the most catastrophic hurricane seasons the Florida Panhandle has ever encountered. I'm meteorologist Melissa Thomas, and allow me to introduce you to... Thomas, here with another edition of the Hurricane Michael's Voice, the project. We're speaking with a voice today who actually lived and rode out the storm in Mexico Beach, Florida on October 10, 2018, when Hurricane Michael made landfall. So, Miss Paula Thorne, thank you for coming out today to speak with us and share your story and insight and perspective with us. You are very welcome. So we'll start with, um, how is Mexico Beach home to you pre-landfall? Well, my husband and I retired here in Mexico Beach a year and two months before the storm. Okay. It was August of 2017, and I had retired in June, and we lived in Northern California. And by the middle of August, we had sold our house, sold all of our belongings, except for the intimate you know, precious things yeah. we wanted to bring with us. We sent it in a pod. We got in our car with our dog and drove across country. Aww. So being in Northern California, um, right, were you on the coast? Were you familiar with like windstorms that came off the Pacific? Not really. My husband did grow up in San Francisco, oh. but um, I was a valley girl in Sacramento. So, <laughs> but... Uh, now, would you say you were familiar with big storms prior to moving here as no. far as hurricanes go? No, not at all. <laughs> not at all. So um, when we got to Mexico Beach was actually our destination, although we, had, we hadn't we had done no shopping for homes. We had not been here before. We just decided by looking at Google Earth and someplace on the coast that didn't have high-rise buildings, we just this was our target where we you know, wanted to start looking. This was a perfect spot because the whole goal is to stay low rise. Yes, exactly. So 2018 rolls around the summer. Are you thinking hurricane? Are you prepared? Um, had you been exposed to hurricane preparedness prior to each season? No, just moving here. No, not at all. Um, I mean, we've heard, we'd heard about it, yeah. you know, our realtor, uh, when we decided to buy in this building, said, you know, that's the safest building as far as hurricanes. It's all Category 4, you know, reinforced with the hurricane windows. And she said, if we ever have a hurricane, I'm going to come to your building to ride it out. That's exactly what she said. 
that's comforting. Yeah, well, that's, that's what we thought. Comforting. That's what we thought. Especially not yeah. being too familiar with hurricanes to, to start off with. Um, right. The month of October rolls in. Are you being exposed to the forecast, the growing storm in the Gulf as it's approaching? What were you thinking, not being real experienced with that scenario beforehand? Well, this sounds kind of silly, but I was kind of excited about it. Not silly at all. Weather fan here. Reason you I'm know? a meteorologist. Mm-hmm. We're out there. Yeah. I was excited. And um, since it seemed like it was only going to be maybe a one or maybe a two, uh, my kids in California were calling me, you know, the day before, get out of there. You guys got to go. It's a hurricane go. And I'm like, no, no big deal. You know, small you, hurricane. You were the opposite end of the spectrum. There's a lot of community members that stayed due to familiarity with storms and comfort. Mm-hmm. I've been through it. You were on the opposite end of the spectrum, but you weren't familiar with what you were about to face. Oblivious. So you hung around very comfortably. Yes. So Any last minute preparations. <laughs> um, did you feel s- secure with what you had as far as food, water? Did someone give you a rundown for, okay, you're of, staying? Of course. Yeah. This is what you're yeah. We were do. watching, you know, the news and everything. And so we had plenty of water. We filled up the bathtub to flush the toilet. And we thought, you know, we had lots of food and a lot of canned food. We figured we'd be without electricity for maybe a few days. <laughs> and so we thought we were ready. And, um, and you had, can see the water yes, from where you're staying. Absolutely. We're on the fourth floor, the top floor of this building. As, as, Gulf, Front, as Gulf Front gets. Yes, definitely. And there were five people that stayed from in this building, uh, owners. And so, but we only knew of the four, of, uh, three of us. We didn't know one, two, three, four. There were six, two more on the other side of the building. We didn't even know they were here until after the storm. <laughs> after the storm was a, a real significant period of bonding for a lot of people. Mm, it really was, yeah. The storm rolls through. You're hunkered, hunkered down. Is it just you and your husband? Yeah, it was just the two of us. And I was actually sitting on the sofa looking out the window at the ocean, you know, about nine o'clock in the morning. I started at seven taking pictures and, you know, Facebooking and all that stuff. And like, oh, yeah. And then about 930. Oh, it's it's getting a little bit rough out there. And then when it started getting really serious, I was thinking, hmm, the wind's getting really, really strong. And the building actually was shaking. And being up on top, I thought, well, maybe it's shaking more for us because we're way up there. And when it started really howling and this and the sound of the wind started getting really bad, um, and the building was shaking, then the no, it was before the fire alarms went off. We have an acquaintance that owns one down on the first floor. I was still on Facebook. It, we hadn't lost power yet. And I, and I messaged her and, you know, told her this building's really shaking. She said, you want to go down to our unit? Go ahead, down on the first floor. And so I was just about to say, how do I get in? Because she had a lock on it. And then we lost power. So we stayed in our unit. And, um, then the fire alarm started going off in the whole building because it was shaking. So we had the building shaking and the sound of the train of the wind and the fire alarms going off. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I smell smoke. <laughs> I thought it was all psychosomatic from the fire alarms. But I, I you know, was running around saying, I smell smoke. And my husband said, That's there's so no smoke. There's no smoke. It's just, you know, from the building shaking. And so he calmed me down. And we had our drapes pulled uh, on the front at that point because there was uh, so much wind. And we were afraid that it might, the glass might break. And I opened the drapes and looked out. And we have an eight-foot balcony. I couldn't see the railing on the balcony at that point. It was just white everywhere except for black things just flying by, you know, objects. Yeah, that weren't real clear, just, just like, just... Pieces of wood, yes, whatever around. it was. Yeah, we, I had no idea what it was. 
So we close the drapes again. And at this time, I'm pretty much a basket case. And <laughs> I probably would be too, even as a weather fan. Uh, I was. <laughs> so uh, my husband uh, took me in the back where the bedrooms are. And I laid down on the bed. And he's like, you know, you just got to, this will be over soon. You know, just kind of trying to yeah. settle me down. And um, I don't remember anything for about an hour after that. So I think... You were not the only one. I shut down. There was um, a couple interviewees I had that have mm -hmm. memory lapse through mm -hmm. the actual Im impact and landfall. There's exactly. A so that's a common yeah. recurring theme. Mm -hmm. I'm loving that. Yeah. So he came back and, you know, kind of asked me how I was doing. Uh, when things had calmed down a little bit, I think it was about 3 o'clock or maybe 2.30 or 3 o'clock. And <clears throat> said, I need your help. And I said, what's going on? And he said, well, I can't open the door the front door because the breezeways are full of water. So, and this whole time he was actually used every towel in our house trying to sop up the water that was coming under the doors. And we had no window breakage. We had no, you know, no Left. breaches that way. But unbeknownst to us, uh, we had lost the roof, the, the building. So, and at that time we didn't see any water coming in or anything, but um, that came later, <laughs> yeah. So anyway, there, uh, we have a window in the breezeway, several, but he says, I wanna, I'm want i going to open this window and climb out if you'll hand me the broom. I'm going to try to, because there's drains along the breezeway, and he wanted to clear the drains so we could open the door and get out, and which he did. So um, there was about six inches of water in the breezeway, and there was so much stuff down in the drains that, and this is still on the fourth floor. This is the fourth floor, yeah. So um, there was so much debris and gunk and stuff in the drains that it, they still wouldn't drain. So he sloshed around the corner to the where the stairwell is and opened the stairwell door, and all the water drained down, Smart. down to the bottom parking very, deck. Very <laughs> yeah. I cannot imagine that. Yeah. I, I, I never would have considered that. As far as being multiple levels up, rainfall mm -hmm. accumulating due to poor drainage during an event like that. That's not mm -hmm. something I've considered. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And because of the location of where, because the wind was coming this way, and our <clears throat> unit breezeway, you know, our door's on the side here, so it was all blowing right down the breezeway and getting caught around the corner by the stairwell doors and the elevator lobbies. So you're emerging at this point yes. to post-Hurricane Michael... It's the, the immediate aftermath. You're, you're coming out of, for Mexico Beach, you are quite literally coming out of the rubble. That's right. Of course, I had been looking out the front, out the balcony, and uh, we live, the building's right across the street from where Toucans was. And um, Toucans was gone, completely gone. It, a, a standing restaurant. Before the landfall. Yes. And then after. Yes. Just yes. I have uh, shared a picture with you about the the night before, a picture of two cans, and then after, after the storm. Before and after. Yeah. Yes. So two cans was actually, most of it was in a 30-foot high debris pile on covering all of 98 on <clears throat> one side of our building. And a lot of it came down into our parking garage, along with about two or three feet of sand. And, you know, we thought that... Everything the wind picks up and just... Oh, yeah. Yes. And your vehicle was located... Uh, it was in our parking garage on the upper level. Um, we thought that maybe the lower level might uh, flood because the street goes down and, and the parking you know, driveway goes down and we're thinking, no, we'll just leave it up on top. We parked it against a big barrier wall so the wind wasn't directly you know, coming in and we thought the water probably won't come in that much over there. Well, it, there were several people, in fact, people that used to live here and some friends actually brought their cars, their vehicles here, thinking this would be a really safe place to park them. And um, all of the, it was, all the cars were just jumbled around in that whole parking deck like a pinball machine 
And they were all, some of them were up end against the back. Some of them were up end against each other. And just with debris and sand all over them, it was just. And you had part of two cans. Oh, yes. Yeah, so we did. The uh, Our vehicle ended up way in the back corner. Uh, and the freezer, the deep freeze door was laying up against our car. And my husband found, he went down and looked around first before I ever went down there. And he said, you'll never guess what's on our car. It's Toucan's freezer door. And it says on the door, do not slam this door. <laughs> yeah, Hurricane Michael definitely slammed that door. It did. It definitely did. Yeah. How long were you in your immediate vicinity post-storm before you started to venture out into the rest of Mexico Beach and see the extent of what it occurred. Well, we couldn't get out because the debris building was, or the debris on the highway was completely, we couldn't go down that way. And we couldn't go to the right either, uh, to the west on 98 because the canal bridge collapsed. So really, we couldn't go anywhere from our building. We were pretty much like, this is where we are until something else happens. That's home base until you uh, yeah. just get maneuverability. Right. So that's when we uh, located, everybody kind of came out, you know, on their walkways and balconies, and we check in on our friends that we knew were here, and then the other couple from across the other side of the building who had ridden the storm out in the stairwell, which was really smart. On it, We have several. We have four. And um, so they were fine, but they had no idea what was going on except for the noise and the and the shaking. So we all kind of congregated. And of course, everyone was trying to get a signal because there's no, there was no cell service. And we knew that our families and friends were going crazy from the moment that I lost, you know, my, all my Facebook postings. Gone. Yeah. Just... Yeah. So um, as it turned out, one of the uh, rental property uh, maintenance people stayed in one of these units because um, they have many in the building um, to kind of keep, you know, watch over the, all their owner's units. And he actually let us into, he was trying to get a cell signal. He was up on the fourth floor, but where he found one was on the other side, on the east side of the fourth floor. And he let everyone that was here in to go out on the balcony and we were all holding our phones up trying to get a signal and certain phones um, with certain cell phone providers actually did get enough of a signal. This was about four in the afternoon. Um, we were borrowing people's phone that there were two people that had a signal and we just texted. Um, we're safe, you know, and my son later told me that, you know, he, both of them, they said, we got, the, we got this text from this number of this person, you know, we've never even heard of. And all it says is we're safe. <laughs> I can imagine that's something I would do. You're in the moment. Yeah. You're just so excited to get yeah. that word out. You don't even think this is, this is mom. We're safe. Yeah. <laughs> it's just the first thing you want to say is we're safe. That makes complete yeah. sense. Yeah. Complete sense. So um, that day we were just, we did want venture out onto the street. We went down the stairwells uh, to and had to push the door open to get the sand out of the way down on the parking deck on the main street level. And um, we did go out on the street and just kind of walk around. And it was just utter disbelief is all I can say. Looking from here, we could see our building was kind of messed up and there was a couple windows broken. And, you know, but it was, we had no idea besides what two cans look like, what the rest of the town looked like. And um, to see that we were actually blocked in, that we couldn't get out was kind of scary. I'm sure. <laughs> um, just stuck on this just massive pile of debris, essentially. Mm -hmm. Or in it. In it. Mm -hmm. Were you able to stay in your home? Immediately after the storm, were you able to, you're moving on to putting things back together now. You have that immediate, it's less of a rebuild and more of a salvage cleanup. Where were you able to start that process at? Was it from home or? <clears throat> well, we stayed the night of the storm in our condo with, of course, no 
know anything. And um, the next morning, early, we could hear helicopters and things. And so, you know, we went out on the balconies and we were like, hey, <laughs> we need some help. <laughs> so finally, I think it was around noonish. Um, the FEMA search and rescue, one of them, teams, came by and they we saw them down on the street and they asked us, how, how do we get up there? And we told them how to make their way and they knocked on the door and I opened it and they said, Your build, this building isn't safe, you have to evacuate right now. And he said, you have five minutes to pack and you can't take a suitcase, just take like a backpack size or a small bag you can carry. That's what they told us. We had five minutes. So, of course, you're scrambling. You're thinking, I need my medicine. I need my papers. I need my insurance, you know, and something to wear, <laughs> maybe. <laughs> so um, we all, all of us uh, that were here evacuated except for one whose uh, spouse was actually, had been out of town and she was on her way back. So he did not uh, leave. He waited for her to get, and she had a car. None of us had a, had a vehicle. Everything was gone. So um, what they had done is they created a, a makeshift bridge out of uh, debris and boards and things to go over the, the canal bridge that had collapsed. And they, yes. And one of our friends who rode out the storm was 84 years old, a single woman. And she lives right upstairs right here. And uh, so we, you know, of course, we're looking out for her, but she's a very independent, self-sufficient woman. She was, you know, she was great. And we all made our way sidestepping across this little, like walking the plank across the canal. Um bridge that they had made for us. So we got across the bridge and with this little pack that we, and I had a, it was actually a small suitcase, but it had pack, uh, back things on it, straps. Yeah. straps. And um, they dropped us. Then we just, then we just, then they just said, now just wait here and someone will come and get you. So we waited and it was very hot the next day. And we waited and we were out in the sun and we waited about an hour and there was, we were just standing there and my husband says, let's just start walking, you know? And I'm like, well, if he told someone to come and get us, we probably should stay here. The road was not passable. It was really, there was debris everywhere and concrete everywhere. And so finally another group of people came by and said, what are you guys standing here for? Another group of, you know, uh, search and rescue people. And we told them and they said, <sighs> they got on their radio and they said, there's these people standing out here on 98 waiting for a ride out of here. So um, they said, oh, see that white van way down there at the end of the street, you know, just about as far as you can see, they're waiting for you. You need to go walk down there. Oh, no. <laughs> so... So we did, and um, walking through that unbelievable scene, um, what our perfect little retirement beach town turned into in a couple of hours was just un unbelievable. The pictures don't do it justice. They don't. They give you an idea, but... Um, when we got down to the white van, <clears throat> he put us in the car and in the van and, and took us down right to the edge of town where the, the first gas station was, the Exxon down there by Tommy T's and right there by the bridge. And he said, okay, everybody out. And we're like, okay, so what are we doing down here? That was, I think it was at Pier Road is where it was. And he says, wait here and somebody will come and get you. <laughs> Sure another van. There's Seriously, another five so people, the right? There's another five people, yeah. you know. So we waited there for about another hour, and finally, um, one of the the other men in our group that had evacuated um, 
said, I'm not just going to sit around, stand around here. I'm going to go, you know, we got to do something. We got to get out of here. And he ran up, uh, crossed to, uh, he went up on 98 and ran down to where the actual bridge is. And um, they had a roadblock there. The um, National Guard had a roadblock there. And there was a Good Samaritan that uh, came down from Navarre bringing supplies and water to the first responders. And he had a pickup and he brought all this stuff down. And And Carl said he was unloading his stuff and and he was, when he finished, he turned his truck around and he was getting ready to leave. And Carl ran up to him and he goes, hey, man, can you take five people out of here? And he's like, absolutely. That is awesome. That is so awesome. So he drove his car down to where we were at his truck and they let him pass through. And then we went. So the there were several, two people in the back of the truck who were sitting backwards looking at stuff as if we were passing, but the road, the trip from Mexico beach to, he took us to Destin because that was the first place he thought that there would be a motel where we could stay. And so we stayed, uh, to get to Destin normally, I would say it's probably, I don't know, two and a half hours, maybe. Yeah. Yeah. uh, Yeah. And it took us about almost four hours to get there because of the the roads were just not passable. Highway 98 through Panama City was especially bad. And down trees and people with chainsaws were trying to, you know, get the trees out of the road and cars were passing on the wrong, you know, on to the wrong side to get just kind of weaving back and forth to get so and they all can all having to work as a unit to figure out how to maneuver mm-hmm. different directions that you're going. Yeah. Hurricane Michael was very double-edged sword in that um, the, there was, like, the water on yeah. the uh, east side. Yes, and then on mm-hmm. the west side was, when it comes back around, the wind damage to Panama City. It was just each side of that storm was doing specific damage and just loving yes. what was yes. in its path. What I thought was really odd is when we were driving from Mexico Beach to Tyndall, through Tyndall Air Force Base, is that, some of the trees, because they're all broken off like matchsticks, but some of them were broken going one direction, and then a little bit further down, they were all broken the other direction. So you could see that the wind, you know. You had to see that up close and in person, the fact that yes. a hurricane, as the eye wall passes over, you get different sides of the wind blowing. Mm-hmm. It swaps as it passes over, and you get to see that in person. And and that's something as a you know meteorologist mm-hmm. as well. Like I knew this, but seeing it is completely different. It was astonishing. It was just like nothing I could ever even dream of. <laughs> I mean, truly, when we were going through town, it was like I felt like maybe I had woken up in in a from a dream into some kind of a war movie or something. It was like a war zone. How long were you um, camping out in Destin? So we just stayed one night, and um, we had uh, different places that we were going to fly to, uh, home for the cup, one couple, and then uh, the our elderly friend was uh, going to go to her son's house, and we were going back to California to my brother's. So we made sure that everybody got, made sure that you know everybody got where they needed to go, and <laughs> took the Uber together. So you know, to the airport. At this point, you're like a little band of oh, camaraderie yeah. survivors. Oh, yeah. You have to make sure that you saw them. Yeah. You saw them through as well. Yeah. You get home to California, mm-hmm. your rebuild begins. I wouldn't even say your recovery. I mean, at that point, it's navigating this. It was just a whole emotional, yeah. you know, mess. And being in, in the comfort of my brother's home was wonderful. And, but then... Then the second stage begins when you have to deal with your insurance, you know, the car. Here we have, we have no vehicle. We have no home. And for the first time in our adult lives, we have nothing. I mean, we, not that we, we didn't lose all of our possessions because stuff in our condo was, was not that badly damaged from the roof uh, leak. But, 
you just like, you know, you just, you're homeless and you don't even have a vehicle. All of a sudden you're just like, (laughs) you go from retired, stable, forever home to floating. What is next? Yeah, exactly. How long did that process take? So I typically ask, what did the weeks after Hurricane Michael look like? What Mm. did the months? But progress was typically so slow for most people. It's kind of the same story. Right. Same answer for both questions. Right. So how did this really think we're coming up on the anniversary of Hurricane Michael? So how has recovery and how was that process for you? So we stayed. Being uh, so far away from home. How yeah, that started that process all the way across. The right. Country. We only stayed there for it was just shy of 6 weeks because stuff was going on. They were they were trying to um mitigate the uh, all the moisture and, you know, people were in and out of our our home with uh, you know, all of our belongings and everything there and we were like we just really need to get back there. So we couldn't find any place to stay, though, around here at that time. We ended up in Panama City Beach uh, in a condo there, which was a nice place to, to stay. Um, well, actually, the, the first night we got there, we stayed in a hotel in, by the airport and then went and bought a car the next day. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, we, we bought our car and then... Uh, drove to Panama City Beach where I had secured a, a hopefully a, a place to stay in one of the condo buildings that wasn't uh, badly damaged. It was partially damaged, but not badly. So um, we stayed there three months. But by that, being there, we could at least, it took us you know, almost an hour and a half most times because traffic was so bad to get here, but at least we could get here. You were in the vicinity to swoop mm-hmm. in, monitor the rebuild, mm-hmm. be a part of the process. And I'm sure that yeah. that alone could be some sort of catharsis. It was, but the biggest problem I had was every time we drove into town, prior to the storm, no matter where we went, as soon as we crossed that bridge and drove into Mexico Beach, I would say to my husband, I just love this little town. I mean, I said that, kid you not, every time we drove into town. I love our new home. I love this town. So every time we drove into town, I just started sobbing. I just couldn't, I was having so much trouble accepting, I guess, what Michael had done to our town. And... um, It got so bad that I decided to, I had seen a a posting, I think on Facebook about some psychologists that were coming from Tallahassee to Port St. Joe to do a free, no charge for anybody, uh, hurricane victims that needed some help, you know, dealing with what they had experienced. I was not exposed to that. I think that's so beautiful. And it was, and it was, I contacted them right away because I knew I had a problem. <laughs> I mean, I, I wasn't right. I'm glad you did. I, I did. a lot of courage. To say, I did. Hey, I need some help with this. And, and completely understandably. And when they contacted me back, the gal that did, very, very sweet person, and she sent me some literature, and it was a, a kind of treatment called EFT. And it's a kind of a tapping where you tap yourself in rhythm, you know, one leg and then the other, and then all kinds of different ways where you tap yourself. Because how they explained was that the, your left brain and your right brain, um, when you experience trauma like that, they get off sequence and they can't mesh well. So that this certain type of treatment that they taught us to do um, was supposed to help your left and right brain get back, you know, together. There were about 12 of us, and after they taught us the technique, then uh, they said for anyone that wanted to do a little more intense, um, which I took part in, they um, took me into a private little room and put headphones on me, and the tapping wasn't on my body. It was actually beeps going in my ears, on one ear and then the other. And they had me think of one of the worst moments I could remember in the storm first. And then the person that was helping me uh, 
talk me through it. And they also wanted you then to think about one of your happiest childhood memories after that. And it was something about synchronizing your memories and I don't know how it worked, but that sounds amazing. That, that drive home. When we left Port St. Joe, we went back to Panama City Beach. That was home at the time. And that drive home was the first time I drove through Mexico Beach without crying. So you would say that it really helped? It helped me. That's awesome. It That's did amazing. help me. Glad. Thank you for sharing that. That's yeah. awesome. You were there for a few months in Panama yeah. City Beach. And then the uh, tourist season was starting. So they did away with the monthly um, rental. And it went to weekly rentals. And we couldn't afford that. So... I was lucky enough to find a place at Barefoot Cottages down here in Port St. Joe. And um, the only way I did that was by, I went on the VRBO and I messaged every single owner. There were quite a few because they had, by that time, most of them, I would say maybe half of them were livable units by that time. They just had flooding on the first floor. So I contacted every single owner that was on there and I told them, kind of what you know my story and that I we really needed a place to stay so we could you know rebuild our place and this one lady an angel said I would be happy to rent to you for month you know month to month you know so that's awesome yeah they're out there the helpers yes. are out there yes definitely so at what so you 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 did the therapy and the techniques and that mm -hmm. helped you travel through everything a little more centered um, would you say that's when you started to feel a little more grounded, um, a little more, um, like leading up to the, the anniversary, are you mm -hmm. back into your home? Um, we just... How did that process work? Yeah. So I know it's a recent, actual It recent is. Thing, so. It's very recent. Congratulations on that. That's Thank you. a little pre-interview thing that mm -hmm. we discussed about. So um, you lived over in Port St. Joe for a while. So yeah, then, until June. And then, uh, and then the owner... Not only did she need her place, but because she had rented it long before that, but um, our loss of use uh, money had run out with our insurance. So we, we once again uh, didn't know what we were going to do. It's an interesting um, circumstances that you're bringing up. I don't think we've actually got to explore with the project just yet. Mm -hmm. As far as finding a stable spot to do your rebuild, it sounds like throughout the year you were jumping. We every were. Every time time limits were running up, every time deadlines, new That's seasons, right. new scenarios for the people helping were coming up. Mm -hmm. You bounced the entire year. We did. To get back home. We did. And that is not, that probably was not very, that was not easy at all considering no. that doing a rebuild from one stable spot is hard enough. That's right. So that is. I mean, it started with when we first got to California, we had to go buy clothes and and a hair dryer, and you know, I mean, just everything. It, when it was cold there, it was mid October in the Bay Area. We had to get jackets, and I mean, it was so. <laughs> and then we had, and then we had to buy a suitcase to put it all in to bring it back. <laughs> yeah, I so yeah. the, the lady in Port St. Joe has to move on to other obligations. Right. So what are you doing at that point? And you're once again jumping in your rebuild. Right. So. We were really, really fortunate to be friends with a couple who are fabulous, who had this whole time, and they stayed for the storm also. Um, they had a couple extra rooms in their house, a young couple with no children. Their house was livable. They were living in it. And this whole time that we weren't, you know, there here, they were letting other people who needed a place to live stay in their home. And it just so happened that in June, right about that time, when we needed their help, they, their rooms were empty. So they offered us a room in their home. Yay. And it became one of the most wonderful experiences. That was awesome. Because not only did we have a place to live that was wonderful, but to get to know this young couple so well 
And my husband's very handy. He's actually doing all the repairs in our condo. Um, so he fixed things all around their house that needed fixing. So, and they both work full time. So, um, you know, I did as much cooking as I could and, you know, grocery shopping. And my husband was doing, you know, repairs that needed to be done badly around the house. And so that was our way of, you know, contributing and thanking them for helping us. Full time hours. Cook, yes. Cook dinner for me. We're good. Yeah, and in <laughs> Panama City too. Uh, the wife worked in oh, works in Panama City. She was making that commute. Which yes. Was difficult. Yes. Yes. Forth. Yes. So, um, we finally got the uh, our certificate certificate of occupancy on October first. Yay. So that we could, we had been working, my husband started working um, on June 1st when we um, were given the okay that contractors could come in and start the rebuild on the interior. The exterior was done enough that they let people come in. So, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. So we, we are, although the building is, yeah, the building is very much in need of a lot more but our unit is good to go. Well, before we wrap the interview up, is there any, any highlights you don't want to forget before we wrap up the interview? Any words of advice? Or, or actually, here's a good one we can wrap it up on. As far as jumping through your rebuild from different locations mm -hmm. throughout the year, what would you say to anybody that had to go through that? Is there, is there any words of advice that would help someone having to rebuild their life while also simultaneously transitioning every couple of months? I think the most important thing to remember, and it was hard for me to remember, is this too shall pass. I mean, you're step by step, you're getting closer and closer, and each move brings you closer to going home. And that's what we had to, <laughs> that's what we had to keep in mind. Well, thank you so much mm -hmm. for everything that you've shared today. I mean, it was very courageous for you to share this story, not an easy story to share, but I absolutely have no doubt in my heart there may be someone listening to it that won't feel so alone in their journey mm -hmm. through what you went through. Thank you. And if anybody tells you that there's a hurricane coming and you should evacuate, you should evacuate. <laughs> well, with community members such as yourself in Mexico Beach, I'm glad you're continuing to call it home. Mm -hmm. This is your beautiful little home. And it may be under rebuild, but you'll get it back to being where it needs to be. I think it, Mexico Beach is in good hands. We're not sure if we're actually going to stay. Oh. I'm well. sorry. <laughs> I didn't tell you that it's before. Okay. Okay. But um, for now, it yeah. is. And we're, we're making decisions about what we're going to do. Well, you will forever have a piece of Mexico Beach. Oh, party, uh, definitely. Mexico, Mexico Beach, Beach strong. <laughs> yeah. Thank you so much for coming out today. You're welcome. Thank you for allowing me to say some words about our experience. Mm -hmm.